here. All right. <clears throat> so uh, let's actually get going with the three problems that we have for this week. The first one is uh, find the largest uh, triangle area. And if I look at the question, um, essentially what it's saying is that you're given a bunch of points and your goal is to actually find the a uh, set of points with three points so that the largest area so uh, how do you think um how do you think you could go about solving for that any thoughts yes yeah, so uh, for the triangle uh, like area we need uh, like a couple of coordinates uh, so i followed that uh, formula like uh, half x1 y y1 minus y2 uh, which i had read earlier like you know during schooling days and uh -huh. it was yeah so um, we choose three points at a time and we calculate area at a point like you know at a time and keep max like you know updating all the time what is the what what is the time complexity of this algorithm so if there are n points then o of nq that's what i had done got it like, yeah. So the question is actually pretty uh, straightforward, and uh, the solution is also uh, the the simplest solution that you can think of for this one is uh, just take the, any three points at a time, and then you have like a formula that calculates the area of a triangle, mm -hmm. and just keep going through the whole process. You get it, uh, and that's an n cube solution, and that is actually uh, lead code accepts it, and that's probably why this is the easy category. Uh, easy. Any other thoughts? uh we can optimize uh, like you know the, the tree has a, sorry tree the triangle has a property that like you know sum of two uh like you know sides can't be greater than the like uh, three third side right and that won't happen anyway if you pick three points mm -hmm. they will oh, form yeah. a triangle right so that is that is something that is guaranteed based on how the properties of triangle is so if I were to say that, let's assume that there are like 1 billion points, right? Now, how mm -hmm. do you, do you think it is actually feasible for you to just go do the N cube solution for that? Or is there a, is there a slightly saner approach that you can do? Has to be a better approach for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Any one of you have heard of this uh, thing called convex hull? I have heard about it, but uh, haven't used it. What do you think is a convex hull? Uh, so like, uh, mm, I don't know that like, uh, in, mm, like if you have a couple of points and you go in order, like, uh, to yeah. that. Convex yeah, hull essentially represents a way by which you can draw the perimeter of, like, if you can, you can draw a polygon shape, right? mm -hmm. which connects yeah, a right. bunch of points. Then all the mm -hmm. points. Uh, that you have in the shape will be either in the uh, they will be within the the polygon that is number one and number two is mm -hmm. that it's a convex hull in the sense that uh, every line that you have right you it will always be like a uh, it will be less than 180 degrees the angle right okay so it will be like a think of it like a regular polygon or something like that right it will be like a polygon where it always it's like it, it goes through in that fashion so uh, the advantage that that gives you is that uh, the convex hull represents all the points that are in the perimeter or the outside side of it. Okay. Right. So theoretically, mm -hmm. if you have if convex hull, is essentially will reduce the number of points that you're dealing with to a or to a fair bare minimum, right? In the sense that you will be uh, as long as you can uh, in a in a typical case, as long as you're looking at the at the points which are in the convex hull, then you have greatly reduced. The, the the triangle the largest triangle will be formed by points within the convex hull of the theory. Right. Okay. But here is the problem. Now, if mm -hmm. I give you one billion points, and all the one billion points are actually uh, say on the perimeter, on the outside side of the thing, right? If every one of the one each point in the. Uh, hey guys, please go on mute if you're not uh, speaking. And I don't think I have a good way of actually controlling that from this one. I have not used this tool before. Thank you. Hey, Dhiro, you. Okay. 
I have I think I was able to put that person on mute. Okay. There is a shared document in case folks are looking at. Um, if you hit go and uh, say open shared document, you will actually be able to see that. All right. Okay. No, I can't. I can't see that document. We're having uh, access it. Uh, on the the UI, if you look at the far right hand bottom corner, you see three dots. Click on that, and it should actually show uh, like manage call quality, and there is like a, a open shared document there. Are you able to see that? It just has the questions at this point of time, but that's where we'll also be we'll be typing things. It will be quite useful. Okay. All right. So continuing the conversation, right? So convex cell actually gives you that. So that's actually a good way of doing it. But again, it's a very uh, it will probably simplify the typical case, but not necessarily the worst case. Because in the worst case, I can give you the same billion points in the perimeter, and that won't really help you do much. So this is really a, a n cube solution. What is the space complexity of this operation? Any thoughts? It should be constant. Yep. Because you're not using any extra space, right? The only thing is you're only storing the current maximum so far, which will probably be the three points that you have picked up. And it's also the, um, the area that the current maximum has. So fantastic. I mean, I really don't want to spend too much time on this question. It was like a very trivial question. So let's go to the next one, which is uh, which is uh, word ladder. And uh, and I think the next two questions are the ones where I'm actually looking at folks typing in code as well, if you can. So uh, anyone who solved the next question, which is word ladder? Anyone at all? You're speaking on mute. Anyone wants to try? So anyone who's actually, uh, let me actually share my screen. All right. So word ladder. The question is that you're given two words. There's a starting word and an ending word. And then you're given a dictionary of uh, of words as well, which is essentially a list of all the words that are possible. Now your goal is to, hey guys, go on mute if you're not speaking, please. Everybody's on mute. Okay. I don't know who made the noise. All right. So the, the goal is essentially to go from one word to another by picking a new picking one word at a time and uh, by tra by transitioning one letter. So give an example is a hit becoming a cog is essentially hit can become hot. Hot can become a dot. Dot can become dog. Essentially, you're only changing one thing at a time. Hit and hot, the I changes. Hit and uh, hot and dot, the H changes to a D dot becomes a dog, lot, log, and cog. So I assuming that this is what is a shortest transformation. If you had a, a I mean, what do you think is the, is the minimum uh, transformation required for this? In order to convert a hit to a cog, assuming that you had all the words in a dictionary, appropriate words in a dictionary, what would be like the shortest transformation? It's five in the example. In this example, it's five. But if if you had different words, like oh, for example, uh, oh. I don't know, maybe like hot was there, okay, 
uh, and then uh, say then hog was there and then cog was there right so that's possible so one two yeah it's possible so essentially um, uh, would that be always the case like if i have a, a three letter word or another three letter word do you think uh, it'll always be three letters um yeah so, for three letters there will be like three times whatever is not matching basically whatever is not matching so for example if hit were to be converted to hot there is yeah, nothing so required just one. just one letter apart right yeah, yeah it's pretty straightforward in that case so as many letters are different that many transformations is probably required right right that is a best possible case and the worst possible case obviously is you have to go through a lot of things so what would what what do you think uh, would be the data structure that you will use to store this and what do you think will be the algorithm that we'll use for this so for this uh, yeah basically we need to do bfs kind of thing um bfs on what um on um, uh, like we we need to try changing every letter um mm -hmm. for the for the begin word we have to try changing every letter and see if the if that word is in word list then we add it into the queue mm -hmm. um yeah you basically need to uh, uh, so go ahead. so from the source to destination like you know we are kind of forking uh, and depending on uh, the um like uh, letters in the dictionary, we can fork in th that, like, you know, that many directions and continue to do so uh, as long as you can reach the, like, you know, target word. So we are building essentially a uh, graph and that is where C is saying that we can do a BFS because every time we are, uh, like, you know, just changing one uh, letter at a time. And so that can is, give us... Uh what does the vertex in a graph symbol symbolize and what does the urge uh, what is the edge in this graph symbolize vertex so is the word like um every vertex is a, every node or every vertex is actually a word okay word and yeah. um the edge will be the maybe... go on you're on the right track go on yeah um uh, edge will be the a letter changed like uh, no it won't be a letter change the edge simply represents the, the connection you can a word it. and its neighbors where the neighbor is essentially one modification away yeah that's it okay and uh, is this a directed graph or an undirected graph uh, it's basically kind of tree um, uh, i think it, it undirected graph right because it can go both directions that is correct it's actually it, it is an undirected graph an undirected graph is essentially uh, why do you, you call it an undirected graph is because uh, the, the the relationship is mutual right if hot is the neighbor of hit then hit is a neighbor of hot as well so there is right. no there is no directionality to the to the edge so it's not like you you're, you're going from one direction to another and not the other way around Okay. All right. Um, all right. So, so that's good to know. Now, uh, you said you're going to do breadth first search, right? So, uh, so now, uh, in order for you to create, so this, you have a couple of ways of thinking about this. One is that uh, for, uh, in order for you to do breadth first search, you need to, you need to actually have this. Uh, typically, you need to be able to answer this uh, question, which is essentially given a node you need to be able to do node.getNeighbors and you should get a list of nodes which are actually neighbors of, of that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you also should be able to have a set of node which essentially covers the visited ones, right? These two concepts need to exist. Now, uh, visited is, a, is not a problem, you can keep it. Uh, get neighbors is a problem because the problem is that you don't, all you have is a dictionary of words, you don't have neighbors, but you don't know which word is a neighbor of which word. So one thing you can do is you can actually do an n-square path. You can go to the dictionary and go through the dictionary and go check every word against every other word. So, oops. 
you can go check every word against every other word in the dictionary and uh, and that will give you uh, the flag saying are they neighbors or not so you in in n square storage right you should be able to figure out who is neighbor of who correct and then your node dot get neighbors can actually give you the all the neighbors of that particular node and that can be you know o of one setup uh, if not what you can do is you can do the other scenario where uh, uh, you can ignore the words and you can permute the letters of the thing so like essentially for h i t you replace the h with all the letters from a through z except h and then for uh, the i you replace it from a through z except i and then for t you can replace from that except that so uh, what do you think is the time complexity of that operation just just do this what do you think is the time complex of that operation um length of the word into 26 is 26 times you need to change right for mm -hmm. each letter so it's length of the word times 26 is that what i'm hearing mm -hmm. 26 Can to you the think power of word again that is length correct of word it is 26 to the uh, why is it 26 to the power so we are replacing every time each character so if we are doing it three times oh actually it 25 is times. yeah 25 times not 26 yeah. but 25 times the word right not 26 because you don't yeah. have to replace it itself the right. in the hit Correct. you 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 are essentially checking uh, the neighbors as 25 of them not 26 of them right it, it, the, the word itself will be one of them so it's 25 times the number of words okay not mm -hmm. power okay because you're not doing both at the same time right so let's let's get back to the let's get back to the question so you've done that so which one would you prefer would you prefer an n square pass to compute all the neighbors or would you actually prefer a ma mechanically figuring out what the neighbors are by doing the the iteration mm. and n square is better right but uh, how, how do you find all the neighbor in n square uh, where n is uh, the number of elements in the dictionary, not the length of the word. Okay. Yeah, like it depends on the length of the dictionary and length of the word. So in, in general cases, you're expecting them to be reasonably large, both of them. So in one case, you're saying that every neighbor, every neighbor check will essentially be uh, whatever. 25 times k, where k is the length of the word, and the other scenario is where you're looking at n square, which is one. Now it depends on how what your typical scenario is, how deep your tree needs to go, and things like that, because that will give you the uh, the amortization, right? The n square calculation is only once you compute the neighbors and you store it, so you don't have to keep doing it over and over again. Whereas the 25 times k thing happens every time, right? You have to keep repeating it over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's actually uh, think about. So fine, let's do, let's assume that you did the neighbor somehow. You picked one of the approaches. I would pick the uh, the twenty five times k approach. That seems logical. So let's do that. Um, I, I heard breadth first search. Why would you use breadth first search and not depth first search? Um, we need the uh, shortest. Uh... That's a giveaway, right? At any point of time when somebody is saying, let's do the shortest path, you would immediately go back and say, hey, that's actually a BFS because that's what will give you the shortest path. The other one will give you, uh, could potentially, if you go down the wrong side, it might actually give you the, the pretty long route, if at all, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, uh, any concerns with the breadth-first search? Anyone who actually does not follow uh, BFS? We need to keep uh, keep visit so we don't go back and visit again, right? That is correct. So uh, for in order for you to do breadth first search tra uh, traversal, you need to have the two concepts have to be defined. Right? If you look at the shared screen, you'll see that line number 10 has the set node of visited, and then it has a node get neighbors 
right? So you need both concepts. So definitely you have to keep track of visited. Otherwise you'll end up going back and forth. Like hot can become hit and hit will become hot and hot will become hit. And you'll be like, you know, ping ponging infinitely between the two and not get anywhere with it. Uh, it's, I mean, you'll eventually get somewhere because it's breadth first, right? So you will eventually get to the answer, but, uh, but yeah, you'll just be wasting time. So you, you'd want to definitely have the visited nodes. Okay. So, uh, uh, how many of you have actually heard of like uh, something called a bidirectional binary, uh, a bidirectional BFS? I have heard. What do you think it is? So you start from um, like you know from top and bottom both like you know from source and target in both directions, uh, so that uh, and we meet meet in the middle somewhere. So we kind of prune a lot of uh, unwanted search because of uh, the way we branch, uh, like, you know, on each level. Mm -hmm. So that may, uh, you know. Why do you, why do you think that it actually helps? How do you, why do you think it works? Like, uh, I understand. So I can't draw the diagram, but if you try to draw a diagram, plane, like, you know, when, when you go from top to bottom, uh, you are basically making a triangle from top to bottom and it is like you know going mm -hmm. in like you know diagonally and you will find something on like say level 10 but if you are like you know going from level 10 and we meet in fact uh, at level 5 we are like you know um, create another uh, triangle from um, uh, like you know bottom to top you will see like there is some area which we are reducing like you know pictorially when i draw it but uh, we can yeah it makes sense so we'll not okay. try to do it for now but uh, let's actually let so just to kind of restate what you're saying right so one of the ways to think about this is that uh, if you uh, imagine that uh, if you're looking at just points in in a two-dimensional space and you're trying to figure out like who are all this point's neighbors it will essentially be the four points up down left and right right then you're looking mm -hmm. at all its neighbors, you will actually see like, you know, it will slowly keep growing. So if you want to look at neighbors, which are 20 points away from the center point, you'll essentially see something that resembles a circle. Mm -hmm. Okay, of, radi of radius 20, more or less, right. right? I mean, visually speaking. Now, if you had two points, which are say 100 units apart, if you did breadth first search from one from the source and you went all the way up to the destination, then you will find it only when uh, uh, only when it actually reaches the end of the uh, only when you have the depth you'll have to you'll go to a depth of 100 right and at that point 99 will not find you the answer 100 will find you the answer now that's what mm -hmm. and you would have explored a whole bunch of points in order for you to get there now instead of that if you actually let's say you did somehow you magically figured out that you you could do like a breadth first search simultaneously from both sides right then mm -hmm. the way imagine you should imagine this it will be like essentially both of them every level the circle size keeps increasing and guess when the two circles meet they meet at 50 mm -hmm. right now the size of the circle or the area of the circle will represent or both circles in the second case and the once a single circle in the first case will represent the number of like you know points you have explored in order for you to find that answer and in the first case it's essentially a circle of size uh, 100 radius 100 so that's pi r square so it's pi uh, mm -hmm. where r is actually 100 right 100 square and in the second case right. is essentially the area is actually only 50 square 50. times two yeah which two is times, much smaller yeah. right it's two times of uh, 50 square versus 100 square so the bidirectional binary search is actually definitely way more effective uh, not mm -hmm. sure if that is something that will be interviewed to code but um, uh, but in case uh, uh, if, if folks are actually on the etherpad, can someone actually take a stab at just writing like a simple binary search, uh, not binary search, breadth first search, straight straight up breadth first, nothing more than that for this question. Go for it. The screen is yours. You guys are on it, right? I can, I don't see anybody else. I cannot. Oh, the, I think the way it works is that you need to, uh, uh, in the screen, you need to go here and then you need to say open share document. So you guys can see that. If you do that, it'll uh, help you, it'll get you here. 
I think it disconnected and reconnected people, so that's why. Yep. All right, whoever that is, go for it. Screen's all yours. So I'd like to see the binary uh, breadth first search, not binary search, sorry. Interested? Anyone typing? Go uh, for it. Like, I mean, like, this is Naga. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. All right, Naga. All right. Go for it. Oh, I see someone is already typing. I'll let them do it. <laughs> yeah, please, please, please. <laughs> so, whoever is typing, can you just, uh, just either say your name or nickname or handle? It'd be easier to refer you with that. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? I can hear you now. Go ahead. Who's this? See if I remember. So, okay. So while the, so we'll, we'll, we'll need a queue for BFS usually, right? Um, yes. So, okay. So we'll say while the uh, while queue, while the queue is not empty. And then we have to put some initial value uh, in the queue. So that's, we could put the starting word. Uh, we can actually create a function. So we'll call this, uh, where, Target. I'm not sure if this is the actual uh, signature that they use in the weak code problem, but that's fine. Uh, we, it's okay. Word in the queue. Oh, the queue uh, is not empty. So the current word equals uh, queue. Okay, so then I know we want to loop through all the neighbors of the current word before uh, we get the We implement that. Uh, we'll put all of these on the queue uh, for neighbor in current neighbor. And then we could check if the neighbor is actually the target. So if uh, mm -hmm. stop. I suppose as we're as we're doing the BFS, uh, we need to keep track of the visited. Mm -hmm. We should have. I could use a. Maybe a hash set. Mm -hmm. Neighbor. When do you put something in visited? Oh. Right, so I think I should check first if it's already been visited. No, um, do you put, do you check visited? Before you uh, put inside the queue, or do you check the check visited? Like, uh, do you, when do you put it inside visited? Do you put it after you take it out of the queue, or along along at the same time when you disconnected? Um, um, as as soon as you put into the queue, think think about it. What are the, there are pros and cons, queue, right? You check if it's if it not visit and you put in the queue. If it already visit, then you skip it. So check the you will, in the, into yeah, the queue. But when you uh, and when will you add it into the queue? When will you add it into the visited? What I was going to do was add it when basically like line twenty five here, uh, like in the within the for loop. But I think uh, let me think about this. So. If cur is already visited, then we don't want to do anything else. So, like, I could add like um, if cur in visited, uh, just continue. Mm -hmm. And then to actually add the neighbors right in there. the queue. No, right there. The next line is like if cur is not visited, then add cur into the visited and continue. Right? I mean, not continue and just move on to the next line. Cur. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's also so add on line 18 too, right? No, you don't because uh, so you're adding only after you pull out. Oh, you don't add it like before you put in, you don't add it because. Yeah, the, the first day is not visited, right? Like the you know, uh, what the the start the start is not we we not we have not put the start as visited. You will not not put the visited because you want to visit it. The act of visiting is essentially taking all your neighbors and doing something with it. That is visit, right? What does visiting mean? Visiting is okay. the act of processing the you note, know, right? You have not done it by just putting it into the queue. Nothing in the queue is visited yet. That is a theory. Okay. Okay. So and, is that but, is that better to say you know you know that's what I, I you know I try to clarify is that like you know can I verify that can I let's see all the node in the queue have not been visited so I check the visit before I put the the, the node into the queue you may not want to do that I mean it's possible but it's just fewer lines of code if you instead of doing it there. You just check if it's visited when you're pulling it out of the queue. So essentially okay. what you're saying is that whatever is in the queue, right? Yeah. More likely than not, it is uh, it is not visited. And if at all something is visited and that's in the queue, we'll just like clean it as we go. Okay. okay. And then as and when I visit this, I will uh, I will process it. So that the, the, otherwise you'll run into this issue always of that, uh, uh, what, what happens when like two elements of the queue actually have the same two neighbors, right? If you have A in the queue, you have B in the queue, and okay. neighbor of A is C, and neighbor of B is C. Okay. Okay. Then what you need, to, then what you'll end up doing is that you will process while you're processing A, you will take C and you'll put it in the queue, right? Mm -hmm. Will you add it to visit it or not at that point of time? No. You shouldn't, but but then if you don't, then when you're processing B, you'll again add C again, right? Mm -hmm. So so the the simpler thing to do, there are like there are a few different flavors of this. Pick one and just consistently do it. There's very little chance of it going wrong. Okay. So the way that is that uh, whoever is writing has written right now is actually reasonable. What you do is you take the first element, put it inside the queue, start with the empty visited. Visited will contain all the nodes that have been processed and I do not want to process them again That is what visited contains right now start has not been processed start has only been uh, Put in the queue. It is meant for processing or spending processing. It is not processing. It's not processed yet So then line number 24 is where you are pulling things out of the queue You recognize fully well that some things that in the queue may or may not uh, Be processed already so you check have I seen this before? If I have, then I don't have to reprocess it. Skip it. If you haven't seen it, then you just uh, add it to the visited because I've, now you are you are processing it now, right? And you just uh, put it in the uh, put it in the thing. So actually, this uh, uh, visited thing can also be uh, after. Essentially, it can be line thirty-three as well. It will still work because you're not recursing, right? You're, all you're doing is like after you process all the neighbors then you can mark it as visited. You're not doing anything with a visit in lines 28 through 32, which is good. Fantastic. So uh, is it? Is that it? Is there anything else? I'm thinking about this. Um, so um, actually, instead of using a set, if we used a dictionary where for visited, where we mark the each node's parent, um, when we break out of the, the BFS, that way we can like reconstruct the path from the start to the target. Um, would, would that be a better way of doing it? No, no, repeat, repeat that. Sorry, I missed you. We just need uh, the length of the uh, path, right? Or we should print the path. <laughs> if you need the path, how will you how will you handle this? Right. I, I was thinking we actually needed the actual path. So that's, yeah, I, what I was thinking was uh, if we actually did need the path, instead of using a set for visited, we would use a hash map. And 
the the key in the hash map would be the node and the value would be like that node's parent with respect to the BFS. So if I get to B from A, then in the hash map B, the key B will have value A. And then that way I can, um, like after I do the BFS and assuming that there's some path between the start and the target, I can sort of back traverse, uh, like I can, I can query the hash, the visited hash map, uh, say, okay, who is target's parent? And then who is the parent of that until I get to start? And then that way I can reconstruct the path. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But, so the visited will no longer be a set, but it will essentially contain a key will be the, the current node and the value will be the parent node. Right? I, I think in this case, that's not uh, necessary because we only need the, the length, right? Uh, sure. No, but if assuming you needed that, if that were to be your scenario, then the visited you cannot do this kind of visited, right? You need to know who added you. Mm -hmm. So you, the visited we talked about two paradigms of visited, right? This is the one way of doing it, where uh, if so essentially the act of visiting is uh, is essentially saying that or let's use the word process. When do you consider a node processed? You consider a node processed when it's pulled out of the queue and when you have, once you have like, you know, seen all its neighbors, that's when node is considered processed. That's the current approach. Another approach is saying that whenever you add something into the queue, it's considered processed. That's it. So in that particular scenario, the, the, at the time of adding it into the queue, you know the parent and you know the child. You yeah. could do that as well. So that's that's another way of looking at it. Right. But good. Let's assume we do the count, right? Let's do the count thing. And uh, when would you actually break? If, if neighbor equals target, then I guess at that point we could break. Uh, but we'd only be breaking out of the for loop. Uh, so we want to break out. Why don't you actually break when current equal to target? Line twenty-five. Right. Right. That work, right? Neat, right? And any concerns? Anybody has any, having any questions or thoughts uh, about this specific uh, uh, question? Then, so the the only other thing is we have to think about when we increment count, right? So um, I think we would just do that at the same uh, level, like at the level of the while loop. Like. No, that won't work. We might put, uh, uh, with, with the neighbor, we need to put the level, level also in the queue, level number. Uh, that might work, but there's a, there, you could do something else as well. We can do a kind of level order traverse. You are doing level order traverse. That is breadth first search, right? No, level by. Uh, yeah. Why? Why not look through the queue size? Yeah. Because if we look through the queue yeah. size in each time. We increase in the count. That's that is one level. No, no. If Q is Q actually contains. If if I have one word which has like twenty neighbors, and uh, the thirteenth neighbor, they're all like all all next immediate neighbors, right? The size right. of the Q won't give you anything. But if you, if you have right thirteen now, neighbor, and then if you have to go to thirteen of them. That is one level, right? Exactly. So how do you know that? Uh, uh, and and so the, the the processing each of the 13, the count should not increase. But as you're processing the 13, you are adding like 50 more neighbors, right, of each of them. For each of those 50, the count should be two, right? How do you figure that out? So that's what this is. There's this technique of called what's called marker, where uh, if you look at line 18, what I have done is I've added a null in the 18th location, right, in the 18th line. So I take the root node and then I put a null. Okay, so then that marks the end of the level. 
okay so when you pull something out of the queue you will see that if if you first thing you pull out is a root node so that's fine you process everything is good the next thing you pull out is a null so what you do is you once you pull out a null what that means is that symbolizes the end of the level mm -hmm. so you increase the count you put the null back you don't put it in the same place you put it at the end of the queue right so you put it you put the null at the end of the next level now all the elements in the queue at the point you pull the null out are all part of the next level Does that make sense yeah and then you continue and that that should give you the count Does that make sense mm -hmm. it's one of the very uh, very common strategies and you should know how how this uh, how to how to make this like how, how to uh, do like a level order traversal of a of a stack or of a, a tree or a or a graph, and then you should know how to do it order by how to actually extract the level number. You could do more things in it, like uh, if you have like an extra data, then you could instead of the the current element being the actual uh, string itself or the word itself, you could probably put the level number or something and deal with it. But it's just extra superfluous information that may not be as helpful. Okay, but this is good. Any question? Oh, I have a, yeah, I have a question, like, or maybe say some, like, as you may take it. Uh, so, on line 24, suppose if we first search for size of the queue, and then that person, I think he was suggesting to most likely run a for loop on that uh, level's queue size. And once we process that, everything in that size, we know that now we are going to increment the level count. Yeah. So that way you you don't have to put the marker. You will just have a variable level somewhere and you will just increase yeah. the level after That's you process That's just one it. more way of doing this. Essentially, let me rewrite this from line 40. So essentially what you do is while uh, you would say, while Q is not empty, right? Then what you do is you would say that, Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please. You process all the elements. Okay. Right. And then you would actually say level that. plus plus. Yeah. That's it. Beautifully will work. And what you put here inside this is also the same thing. Uh, the same stuff that you had up, right? Which is like you know, find all neighbors. Uh, for for right. neighbor in in that in uh, whatever you can just pull one element at a time you can do all that stuff here uh, it works but there is one I generally don't like uh, this approach uh, it's it's more like a more of a it it'll work but I just think it's more of a stylistic thing you don't want to run a for loop on a on an unbounded data set in general. So if I like you don't want to you don't do a for you don't run a for loop in like a stack or a queue or a linked list. Um, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, unless uh, very rarely do you actually say that I want to take the first 10 elements of something. Right. I mean, so in this particular case, it's like you. It just sounds a little. Um, it doesn't seem to fit with the queue paradigm. That's all. But it's fine. Okay. It, it, it's logical and it works. So this is also another way of doing it. And. Uh, uh, it's, I've seen people use null markers or people use this. The other thing I've seen people do is that they essentially have two queues, like the, the previous queue and the next queue. So they are like, they have a current level queue and the next level queue. So they, while the current level queue empties, they'll keep going through it. And then at the end of it, they'll just switch the queues around. Mm -hmm. That also mm -hmm. works. I mean, there are like a few different ways to do it. This is uh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So. I have uh, uh, I have a one question you know re regarding the the visit again uh -huh. like you know what the, the first time was like you know inside the queue it's only contained a node we have not visited right so we like the the, the way I thinking before was like check you know if we not we have not visited the node and put it in the queue so the queue size is going to be smaller but let's say, suppose we put, you know, all the node in the queue, and then when we get the node out, we check for the if we have not we have visit 
uh, the node or not, then the Q size potentially would be bigger, right? Yeah. If you check before you add to the queue, that's what, I mean, there are two ways of thinking about it, right? When do you consider something visited? When do you consider something processed? You could consider it as processed the moment it adds, it goes into the queue, right? And if that be the case, then you can just use that as your uh, visited. So you can, you will add it to visited before you check and you check before you add to the queue and you will add it to the queue and you will add it to the visitor at the same time. Okay, you could do okay. that. And this is the other way of doing it. Both are reasonably fine. The method that you're talking about actually has a few more comparisons, like one more comparison in line 37, 38. And, uh, and uh, depending on, so here's a very simple chain, so you don't have to do much, but if there are uh, other rules based on which you are actually deciding whether you want to add something or not, then you may have more complications coming up your way. Okay. But, um, but, but, but both, do, both are reasonably fine. Okay, but you would recommend do this way? Uh, I don't know, actually, it depends on the question. Uh, specifically, okay. if the question was uh, find the, uh, the actual path that you need to take, then I don't think this will work. Because there's no way to know who added you, right? So the only way that will work is that the visited in that case will not be a set, but it will be a map and it will have to do it the way that you are saying. Okay. Okay. So maybe in hindsight, I think I'll probably do it the way you're asking. The, the way you're recommending, right? That probably is a better way of doing it. My recommendation is pick one, stick to it, know how to do it the other way, but, but pick one way of doing it so that you don't get confused. Uh, because if you mix and match, right? For example, if you're added that element in the set here and then you use this logic, it will not work and things like that. So, uh, so just pick one mechanism and one, one way of doing it and then continue. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I know we will actually run out of time. Uh, so, but I just want to let's let's anything else. In this, any 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 other questions or challenges or concerns in this thing? So, each of these questions in general in an interview setup is supposed to take somewhere between like twenty to thirty minutes for you to solve this, right? And uh, and the question actually has multiple phases. The very first phase is essentially around you understanding what the question is. Ask the interviewer every set of question. Make sure that you know exactly what the interviewer is looking for. What are the inputs? What are the outputs? Brainstorm new test cases, test data, edge cases. Like how long uh, will the words be of same length, different length? Because it's always one uh, one variant, right? If the start and length are uh, of different lengths, then you can just exit. You can probably do that as comparison in line 15 and be done with. So there are a bunch of things you can do and that will just get the thing done for you. Uh, next thing is essentially your, um, uh, that's first step. Second step is to come up with algorithm where you've said, I'm going to use breadth first search, bi-directional, one direction, whatever that is. So that is your second step. We got there as well. Third step is writing code. We got that as well. The fourth step is actually very important. Don't miss it. That's actually requirement verification is to go back and make sure that what you actually did solve the problem that we came out to solve. This is where you will test your code, right? It's very hard to do it on, on, a, on this kind of an environment and setup where you don't have a whiteboard in front of you or something. But the fourth step is absolutely important. I've seen so many, so many times when people actually write the code and say, yeah, I'm done. I'm like, no, you're not done. You have to walk me through this thing. You have to test it. You have to, at the very minimum, use the same data set that we discussed in uh, step one in the step four and make sure that that thing works. So that's what I wanted to make sure that we are doing. Uh, we try to kind of build that discipline and rigor. And uh, in terms of timing, the, the oh, uh, am I audible now for the rest of the folks or is it not? Am I not audible at all? I can yes, hear I can you. Hear. Okay, so I think it's probably something wrong with uh, that one person who's actually complained. Okay. So what I was saying is step number one should be about five minutes, less than five minutes. Okay. Uh, step number two is essentially, uh, 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 this is the one where you're actually coming up with a problem and brainstorming, right? That's about between five, seven minutes, maybe 10 minutes stops. Step number three is probably another, like again, five, seven, 10 minutes stops, depending on what it is. Uh, usually it will be a very simple straight up algorithm. So that's, this is where, you should know the algorithm in your mind. Like if once you figure out as BFS, 
you should take like it should be a three minute job to write down. You're not coming up with anything. It's like for this, while this, set, blah blah, and done. And like it's like three four minutes and you're done. And then take a uh, take two or three minutes for the last one. If I put together the whole thing, it'll probably be like a, a two three minutes, seven eight minutes, seven eight minutes, and two three minutes. That essentially gets you the twenty twenty two minutes window. Uh, and that gives you a little bit more buffer for it. So this is what I would expect. The like an anatomy of like a a good coding interview. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. All right. Perfect. So uh, now let's let's jump on to the the last question. We have about ten minutes. So uh, let's do each step as we talked about. Item number one is essentially to figure out uh, what the question is. So go. Who's gonna Who's gonna ask questions? Who's gonna explain the question? Pick anyone. Anyone who's seen the question, go for it. Step up. It's an opportunity. It's anonymous. Mm -hmm. Mm, hi, this is Naga. I think this problem I have seen before. So Go ahead. They, me, um, they have given a board like which is basically some characters like horizontally, vertically. I mean, like they are not really a words, but like uh, they also give a dictionary of words, and we need to see if um, like either horizontally or vertically, if you can form any of the words listed in the dictionary. And uh, whichever you find, uh, that's what you need to uh, return in the output. So, okay. So, given that, then you should just go to the step thing, which is like given this example. Mm -hmm. I can see O A T H and I can see E A T as words. Yeah. Okay. Go on. So now, now let's come to. So this is like what took about a, less than a minute. So we are good. Let's go mm -hmm. to the next step. Algorithm design. So it's basically we will again. I mean, like since it's basically finding a word, maybe um, I mean, like one approach is doing a DFS with this, like uh, you going horizontally or vertically, just to see if you can hit a word. I mean, like at each step, you see uh, whether you can find a word or not. Mm. So I don't know, like for this words can be structured easily in a try um, to see if they can be found or not at each level. So you made a few decision points here. You said you're going to use DFS. Why are you using DFS instead of breadth of search? Um, yeah, this, that is just one of the thought. Like, I mean, uh, the reason for DFS, I thought, is like uh, you can uh it's basically once you find the word i mean like it which starts with that i mean like it's more likely that you are going to form a word right i don't know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah mostly that so the, the, this is how my my this is what my thinking will be again mm -hmm. the goal here is not to just solve this one question right the goal is to actually come up with what would be a thought process of Mm -hmm. How you would approach these side kinds of questions or something. So if, if I look at this question, it looks like I can either use DFS or BFS. BFS. Both are equally fine because I mm -hmm. I need to make one letter words, two letter words, three letter words, and I need to make sixteen letter words, right? I need to go through the entire tree. Mm -hmm. I have to go through everything, so I don't have a choice. But I mean, I have to go through the whole thing. It's like think of it as a as a tree in this case, even a graph. But if I traverse the entire thing. Uh, if I, I think this is like this is that uh, what's that Hamilton path or something, right? Where you have to traverse all the edges, all the nodes, right? So that that thing you have to do anyways. So the problem that you have with that is that um, I mean I can do that. So DFS or BFS will just work reasonably fine, but uh, it doesn't make sense for me to go and traverse those specific oh. those specific yeah. paths. If I have no word that begins with O E I in my dictionary, then why would I bother, right? And then I don't have to even traverse. Like I don't have to do everything. I can aggressively prune my um, my my search space, and it looks like what I'm pruning is essentially all the child nodes of that particular traversal. So it's like you know a DFS will probably work very well, and I don't have to think too much about the the BFS as queues that I have to maintain. Uh, maybe I can do this with DFS, but DFS seems more logical to me. So I mean, they both are equivalent. DFS is just simpler to write, so I'll use DFS here. So, yeah. 
for lookups like i don't know if we can mix uh, also use try data structure just to represent the dictionary to i mean like if they're like bigger length matrix it will be useful right yep try data structure so why did you why, why are you using try um like at each step like if you suppose you have form like oea and you want to know whether this word, I mean, like the word with OA starts is there or not in the word list. Mm -hmm. Do people know what, uh, what a try is? Is there anyone who doesn't know what a try is? I do not. Okay, a try is, a, is a, a, like a, you know what a set is, right? A set is a data structure, which will answer a question saying, does this set contain this element or not? And it'll actually return the data in like O of one time, correct? Yes. A set will give you membership. A try will actually give you something similar, but in a, in a if you take a dictionary of words and then you put it inside the try, the try can actually quickly answer the question saying, do you have any words that begin with this, these letters? A try is also called a prefix tree. So essentially you take the data and you organize it uh, in the form of uh, the prefixes. So that way you can, all, you can ask questions saying, how many words do you have? in the dictionary which which begin with OA and it'll tell you that there are like 14 words or something. And it could, it'll all the 14 words will have the property that the first letter is O, the second letter is A, the rest of the letters will be different, right? Or may or may not be different because uh, all you know is that the first letters are O and A and it is organized as a tree. So the complexity of the time complexity for the response is not O of one, but it's log N. Uh, it's essentially as deep as the tree would be. So it's an interesting data structure. Uh, it is definitely worth knowing. It actually helps you in questions such as these, and there are like a few other dynamic programming questions where a try will be helpful because you can aggressively cut down. Like, you know, once I know, like, do you have, do you have words beginning with O? Yes. Do you have beginning with uh, OA? Yes. Do you have words beginning with OAA? Like, no. Then you can actually completely forget going that path and you can forget about it. You can come back and look at OAT and OATA not there so you can ignore that and then so on so you can keep cutting your tree or pruning your your uh, your exploration space pretty pretty well so okay. with, even with the try we still need to do the the depth first search right that is correct the depth first search the try part of it is essentially that should i continue processing is the question right so i am let's assume that you somehow navigated your way to a uh, in the second row, third third column, right? O, A, T, you, you've come there. Now you can go either up, down, left, or right, right? You, you can either go up to A, left to T, right to E, or down to K. Now, if you had no words that begin with O, A, T, A, then there's no point in doing that recursion step. So you actually will, uh, will cut the recursion if you don't have any words beginning. So the try is just more of, it's very similar to that visited concept that we saw in Q, right? If there's no chance that going down this path is going to give you any answer because your try is smartly giving you the data, then you can do that. It's a very good data structure to, to know. And uh, so that first search is the answer for this one. So just again, uh, in the interest of time, I'm kind of like skipping over some parts here. But um, uh, again, the same parts. Question definition took about a minute or so in this case, not more than that. The problem solution domain definition was about four-ish minutes here. That was because Naga already knew the question, so he was able to quickly latch onto this. But if you didn't know, you probably will be like, you know, going around, I'll try this, I'll try that. But you should be able to narrow down in about six, seven minutes. This one is not that difficult if you know the data structures. If you didn't know try, then you would just do a simple DFS and move on. Uh, most likely than not, the interviewer will start poking you to either uh, come up with a try as a data structure, like somehow invent the try data structure in the remaining 20, 25 minutes that you have or something like that, it'll be a fun conversation. But knowing try, try is very commonly asked. I would, uh, I would prepare for it as well. And then uh, coding this should be very simple. Uh, try is, you don't have to write the try, you just assume that try is there. So you can just load stuff into the try and you would just say uh, try dot begins with, or like, you know, this does the dictionary contain words that begin with, and that's it. Neat. And we, of course, didn't test, but uh, given that we didn't write the code, there's not much to test. So any questions on, the, on this word search? It's actually a very simple question if you know what you're doing.
Mm. Did you you mentioned that you did try at the visit, right? You you have to do visits as well here because you can't go oh. back to what you visited before. I'm just saying, just like how in the breadth first search you're using visited as a concept to not okay. revisit the your cutting right. So in the same way you can you're using try here, but you also have to use visited because you don't want to repeat any node. Like once you go from O A T A, you can't go back to the T. I see. That's not allowed. I mean, uh, it's a question mm -hmm. to ask in the phase one. So because well, like suppose in this matrix, there's many paths to get into a for a single word, there's many paths to it, then, uh, then we would, would not we, have we, many. I mean, if you have, like, let's assume that the the second row, first letter was also A, then the way you could have had O, A, T, H would have been O, go right to the A, down to T and down to H, or you could have done O, down to A, right to T and down to H. Right? You could have gone to the word oath in two different ways if the second row, first letter was A, correct? Yeah. But uh, let's say the, there's another path, let's say from the bottom right corner that take also going to OATH too. And uh, I mean, we, we need to explore all the, them, right? You have to explore all the paths. You have to, you have okay. to start from every location and then you have to like use every letter as the first word and then you have to explore up, down, left, right. Uh, okay. Just note that this is also, there's a game called Boggle, which works exactly the same way. And I think it's called Wordament, I believe, in, in the Windows uh, App Store. And you have the same app in Android as well and iPhone. But there, you're also permitted to go diagonally. So every every letter has nine neighbors, not uh, eight neighbors, not four. Okay? But it doesn't make too much of a difference. It doesn't change the complexity a whole lot, but it's just uh, uh, just makes it a lot more fun to play. All right. Awesome. So what I'll do is I want to stop this uh, recording bit here.